If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to Daniel chapter 1. That's where we're going to be today. All right. And when you think Daniel, you think what? Lion's Den. That's exactly right, because most of us were raised in Sunday school, and that's what we think of. And so I I pray that the, the Word of God speaks to you in such a powerful way this morning as we jump into this text um, uh, God has uh, shown us a lot. We've actually gone through this text with our college ministry this semester, and um, uh, I am one that uh, I'm reluctant to go through heavy books, especially of prophecy, with college students. Uh, and it was absolutely amazing this semester as we walked through Daniel, uh, the, the, the turn in Daniel after chapter 7, uh, when he starts talking about prophecy, came exactly when COVID-19 started to hit us, and we began to meet on things, with, on things like Zoom. And so it was a very interesting uh, turn. And so, uh, but I will tell you this, God showed me so much uh, this season through this book And I think that we need to look at these kind of books as we look at the season in which we are in. As we look at the book of Daniel, uh, it is very clear the whole theme of, of Daniel is almost faith under fire. How many of you, you have been in a place, you have lived in a season where your faith has been under fire? Like by show of hands, like you, you, and maybe you're there right now, like you've seen, you've seen it. And some of you, maybe that's not the case. Maybe your faith hasn't been under fire. And some of you, you'd say, well, our faith isn't under fire like the people where the church meets in secret, uh, and they're not allowed to talk about faith. And you're, you're right if you're saying that. But, neither, but, but either way, we, are, we still go through tests, and we still go through trials, and our faith certainly comes under fire if we're believers. Never forget, working, uh, my degree is in psychology uh, from Texas A&M Commerce. That's where I met a uh, beautiful girl back there, on the very back, who I can barely see right now. Let me get my glasses. And so, um, and uh, I was in a social psychology class, and every single person in the room uh, was either atheistic or agnostic. Uh, and I remember them, the professor bringing up this reality that religion is for the weak. And, and I remember standing with, with no one by my side except this one person that was kind of confused and had some ideas about spirituality. I wish that person wasn't standing with me, but I remember standing there and debating every person in this class and saying, listen, this is, (laughs) I don't care about what you think. I care about what he, about what he says and who he is. And that was a reality. Like, I remember that. I remember working in the secular world right out of high school. I remember being uh, persecuted uh, by some, some people in a machine shop and uh, in, in the hospital setting in which I worked for what I believed. I remember when my faith was under fire. And I think this is interesting because when I think back a little further, when I was in middle school and when you were in middle school, which was a little further back than I, when I was in middle school, are you all with me? And so um, nobody laughed at that. That was a joke. Uh, I, when, when that, I remember the enemies in our society were kind of clear, right? It, the enemies were clear. But today we're living in a world where the enemy is everywhere where, and, and he's nowhere at the same time, isn't he? Um, this pandemic produces fear. No one knows what to do. Protests and riots rage through the nation. Hate speech is everywhere. What's right changes every day, so it seems, right? This is, and let me just make a simple observation of, of our times. Are you okay with that? All right, so throw, put, keep your rocks to yourself or whatever, right? Your tomatoes, whatever you delight to throw. A simple observation of our times is mind-boggling. If you simply utter the phrase, all lives matter. You are a racist. If you say things like sex is only for marriage between a man and a woman, you are homophobic and uneducated. If you say there are only two genders, you are intolerant and transphobic. If you say things like Jesus is the only way to heaven, you are ignorant, xenophobic, a bigot, and hateful. Are you seeing that with me? 
Are you guys seeing the same thing that I'm seeing in our world right now? To be woke, that's our world's definition, to be enlightened in our world right now is to only agree with what the world says about sex, gender, marriage, money, happiness, purpose, and God. And there's a problem with that, right? There's a problem with all those views because those views don't line up with the views of our God in this book. That's the problem. And, and, and I'll, just, I'll just speak my own beliefs right now. It doesn't matter what you think or how you feel. It matters what God says. Like, that's the reality that we will be judged by one day. It matters what God says. But for believers in what God says, we are caught in the crossfire, aren't we? Right now, as a world becomes worse and worse. And I'll just, I'm going to break this to you. If you study Revelation or you study the end of Daniel, the world will get worse. Like, it doesn't matter who will get elected. The world will get worse. Like, you can just if any Bible, any student of the Bible will tell you that. Are you with me? And so our faith will increasingly be under fire. So the question for us this morning as we jump in is how do we as believers in Christ live in a world where our faith is under fire? And I'm thankful that the answer is nothing new. Because <laughs> it's been this way for 2,600 years as we jump back into Daniel. So we're going to unpack Daniel chapter 1, and I just want to give you a little bit of context before we do that. Are you with me? Are you ready to dig into God's Word? Amen. Amen. Uh, those online, are you ready? I heard you, friend. There it is. So Daniel, uh, he was taken into exile. The book begins. He's taken into exile in 605 B.C., around the age of, some scholars say, 15 years old. Daniel was a teenager when we begin this book. When King Nebuchadnezzar made a raid upon Judah for wealth, slave labor, brilliant, skilled young men to help enlarge his kingdom by serving as slaves, they took Daniel on this. Um, some scholars believe that Daniel, and in fact, it would have been the custom of this day. If you were a king and you conquered another kingdom, you would force the occupants of that kingdom to walk all the way into your empire. In a great parade. And so Nebuchadnezzar would have likely forced Daniel, who is age 15, to walk over 700 miles from Israel all the way to Babylon. Daniel would have forced him to walk this distance. And ultimately, God let this happen. And some of you would say, why would God let this happen? Why? The, the time of the exile, why did God let this happen? And we understand that answer in Scripture as well. Scripture tells us it's because of years of rebellion. In fact, for 490 years, God's people did not obey God's command to let the ground rest every seventh year. You say, well, that doesn't sound like a big commandment. But can I just remind you that every commandment that God gives is important? It is God-breathed. It is profitable for reproof, for teaching, for training. All godliness, like God gives his commands so his people might obey them. And so God said, every seventh year, you're going to let the land rest, and Israel forsook that. They, they did not. They continued to work on the, on the seventh year. And so God had them exiled for seven years. When you look at this, they did this for 490 years. They disobeyed that commandment. So if you divide that time by seven, you get 70. God punished them for each year. He, he, they, they, they spent 70 years in exile. This is what happened. Some, some of you think God doesn't care about his word. God cared enough to allow his people to be exiled because they broke his word. Are you with me? And so God allowed this scene to take place, but there's this greater story going on in the book of Daniel, and that's what we're about to see. That's what we're about to see. So Daniel chapter 1, starting in verse 1. This is where we are going to pick up, and we read this. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of, what's the word? Shinar. Turn to your neighbor, say Shinar. Shinar. To the house of his God. And he placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. All right. So we've got the king of Babylon. Again, he, he comes and he travels to the west. 
He takes Daniel, he takes Judah, he takes these captives and brings them to the east, right? To the land of what? Shinar. Very good. Good students of God's word this morning. Good. All right, so then we, we go on, verse 3. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge and understanding, learning and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. Then the king assigned them a daily portion of food that the king ate, And of wine that he drank, and they were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called what? Abednego, right? All right. So as we begin to break this down, I want you to see behind the scenes, and that's what we're going to do today. If you're a note taker, you're about to be um, bombarded with a ton of notes as we look at God's Word, because there's something going on behind the scenes. Some of you say that's just context. There's more that goes on behind context. And what I want to tell you this morning is very clear, and it's this, that there is a counterfeit kingdom at work behind the context every single time there's a counterfeit kingdom at work. That's what we see right now. In verses 1 through 6, we have the unique perspective to see the agenda of the counterfeit kingdom. You're like, Austin, what in the world do you mean? Well, let me just make it very simple. Satan is not alone in his control in this world, right? Satan is not alone. Sometimes we get in this habit of blaming the devil on everything. Like he's, he's our, like personally there, <laughs> you know, like Satan is not God, so he's not omnipotent. So he can't be every place at the same time. He's not God. So some of you, you, you blame Satan on everything when in reality, Satan works with a host of demons and beings to accomplish his purpose. That's what he does. Uh, Ephesians six twelve tells us this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against what? The rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of the world's darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, I don't know about you, but he didn't just say demons, did he? <laughs> he didn't just say, he said, there's a lot of stuff. We're like, Austin, what's that all mean? I don't know. <laughs> but it is not good, I'll tell you that. It is not good. There's a whole world. Some of your versions say principalities. And this is interesting because this word principalities, it refers to a being, a demonic being that is, uh, you could say it's a big demon or a bigger demon. It governs or rules over a region. You know how we know this? Because later in the book of Daniel, Daniel will have a meeting with a divine messenger who says, I've been withheld from coming to meet you for three weeks because the prince of Persia has withheld me. And you're like, well, the prince of Persia, what's that mean? That's a demonic force that rules over a region. Wow. And I, I just think this is interesting because the Bible says that we, in, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we tear down strongholds. <laughs> we tear down strongholds. We now, through Christ, have the ability to war against even these things in Christ alone. Are you with me? Like, this is a reality. But again, I just need you to see this, that Satan is not alone in his control. He's not. And so, uh, Revelation 17, we're going to turn there. In fact, before we do that, God, I'm not going to go deep into this, but God has a divine counsel when we look in the Old Testament. He has, he has a hierarchy of angels. Some of you know this because we have Gabriel and Michael, and you're like, that's about all I the angels I know in the Old Testament, right? And these seem to be greater angels and maybe there's lesser angels, but but there is. There's a hierarchy in angels, but Satan replicates and counterfeits that hierarchy himself, doesn't he? That's what we see in this text. And I'll I'll break this down to you in just a second. See, we start seeing Babylon and we're going to read quite a bit about Babylon, but behind Babylon there is a spirit and that spirit is called the spirit of, guess what? Babylon. The spirit of Babylon is behind the scenes here. I'll prove this to you. Revelation 17. It's not going to be on the screen, but just listen to this verse. Revelation 17 says about the spirit. By the way, the spirit's not gone. The spirit hasn't ceased to exist. The spirit's still at work today. 
You're going to see his effects this morning. Revelation 17 says this, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual morality the dwellers on the earth have become drunk. And on her forehead was written in a name of mystery, Babylon the great mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. That is not a title you want. Are you with me? (laughs) This is an enemy of God, and it is the enemy behind the scene in the book of Daniel. And so as we we read this, we're going to expose the enemy's agenda and work. All right, you ready to dig in? All right, so we go on. The first, what's the first thing we read? In the, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar the king came to Jerusalem and he besieged it. What do we see? We see this reality that Babylon brings slavery. He besieges it. Uh, it, says, it says, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. The first thing that we want, I, want to, I want you to see this morning is Babylon, the spirit of Babylon brings slavery. It brings slavery. And, and, and why is this a counterfeit kingdom? Because God offers what? Freedom. But Satan and his forces, they force slavery. This is his agenda. This is his work. Let me just ask you a question. Is this going on right now? They're like, well, we're not being besieged. And some of you are like, oh, yes, we are. <laughs> just give you two very quick examples in, in the world of youth, drugs. Right now, five, just a few years ago, a study came out. It came out with this, this reality that 14.8% of the population of, of, of teenagers between 18 to 25 battled some substance use disorder, battled drugs. It equates to about one in seven of every young people. Fought this. Are, have you guys seen anybody affected by that in your life? By show of hands? Oh, so you've seen Babylon bring slavery. I have. Pornography. 90% of teens and 96% of young adults are either encouraging, accepting, or neutral when they talk about pornography with their friends. Have you guys seen any? And you, maybe you haven't because that's not a common thing that we talk about today in our culture. But let me just tell you, it is very common in the culture of every young person I have ever talked to. Is Satan trying to bring us into slavery through this means? Yes, absolutely. While God offers freedom, Satan forces slavery. All right, let's, let's go on. It says, Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into their hands with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of what? Shinar. He brought them to the land of what? Shinar. All right, so they went west to Israel, and they came east to the land of Shinar. That'll be important in just a little bit, so pay attention. Hang in there. What I want you to see in this moment is that Babylon leads to dark places. It leads the people of God to dark places. Uh, God's people were brought to a demonic region. And you're like, well, I don't know what Shinar is. I don't know. I've never heard of that. Is that somewhere outside Sherman? No, it's not. Uh, but Genesis 11, 2, 4 tells us where Shinar is. And Genesis 11, 2 through 4, it says this. And as the people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen and mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top to face the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. What? Yeah, this land was the land of the Tower of Babel. This is the land of Shinar. It's the same demonic region where people opposed God. And made for themselves, made themselves like God. That is the region that the spirit of Babylon is leading God's people. God leads us towards the light, but Satan leads us towards the dark. Like that's the counterfeit kingdom. Are you with me this morning? You guys still following along? Like, do we still see this today? Yes. Anybody notice this? Like what's bad is becoming worse. I think it's funny because it's hard to watch a show that you enjoy without something bad in it. Are you with me? Like, if you walked out every time you heard a a word of profanity from a movie, you would not go see movies. 
You just wouldn't. And so, like, there is, it is very hard in this season to find anything wholesome, anything godly. Why? Because as a society, we're being drugged, and God's people in this society are being pulled towards dark places. God leads us towards light. Satan leads us towards darkness. We go on to see, and the Lord gave, again, Jehoiakim into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. We see that Babylon, not only does he lead to dark places, but he steals, the spirit of Babylon steals what belongs to God. The vessels of God's temple, these golden vessels, they were used to bring worship and honor and glorify the name of the one true God, Yahweh, And what does the spirit of Babylon do? He steals not just the people, but the vessels that were used to worship God, these golden items, and he brings them back to the land of his God. Uh, It's just interesting because while God creates worship, Satan steals what? Worship. It's the counterfeit kingdom. Are you following along this morning? Like, it's the counterfeit kingdom. Matthew 4, 9 through 10. What does Satan tempt Jesus with on the mountain? Satan tempts him with this. All of these things, all of this kingdom, I will give you if you will fall down and do what? Worship me. It's the ultimate steal. It's the ultimate rob from God. Satan tries to tempt Jesus himself, the son of God, to fall down and worship him. Wow. God creates worship. Satan steals worship. Is this still going on today? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, nothing is sacred anymore. So it seems in our culture. There was a night, and I've talked to youth workers and college workers, there was a night when Wednesday nights used to be reserved for church because school districts knew that that keeping students in church was a way to to prepare them for the future more than anything else, more than any sporting event. Are y'all with me? There was a day when that was a reality, and now not even Easter morning is reserved and sacred. Are y'all with me? Babylon steals what belongs to God. Then it goes on to see the, uh, we'll just go on to the next, this next thing. This is going to be a little bit controversial. So brace yourselves, all right? You ready? Some of you just woke up. That's good. It says, and then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of nobility, youths without blemish of good appearance, endowed with knowledge, and competent to stand in the king's palace and teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. What we see in this text is that Babylon butchers gender and identity. Well, how are you getting that? Who was it that went to retrieve Daniel? Ashpenaz. The name you do not want to name any person in your family, okay? Just take that off the name. The chief of the what? The eunuchs. And if you study the Old Testament and you study old, the, this, this part of the world in this time, it, to stand in the king's palace and to be a young man, there was only one way you could do that, and that was if you were a, guess what? A eunuch. And that, that, that would, and if you're not sure what that means, you can go home and ask your family. That's okay. And um, if you're here, and I'm, that was a joke, but uh, that's all right. Um, this Daniel would have likely, as a 15-year-old young man, been forced to walk 700 miles, mistreated, abused, and then come to a king's palace to be castrated, to, to be put in this system. That was Daniel. It's kind of blowing your mind. You think Daniel and the lions, then you don't think about all these, these things. And th- but there's this reality behind the scene, and it's this reality that the spirit of Babylon and all these things, it butchers gender and identity. Daniel would have been castrated. He never would have been allowed to marry. He never would have been allowed to have a family. He never would have been allowed to leave a physical legacy on this earth. And we understand that to be true because we don't have any kind of connection with a, a legacy he leaves at the end. Are you with me? As far as Family. While God institutes identity and roles, Babylon destroys identity and he confuses roles. Is this happening today? Yeah. Just the last I checked, Facebook now, if you have a Facebook or if you're about to make a Facebook, you can choose not from one, not from two, but from 58 different genders to match your profile. 58. All right, y'all with me? Some of you guys are wondering what those are. 
I'm not even going to waste the time to go over it, okay? Like, that, that is the reality of what our world is saying. And some of you think this is a new issue. This is not a new issue. This is a, just a demonic issue that's been around for a long time. We're reading about it 2,600 years ago when gender and identity were butchered. And then it goes on to say this. Um, the youths, uh, then the king commanded Ashpenaz to bring some of the young people, both of the royal family and of nobility, youths without blemish to do what? To stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. We understand that Bab- the spirit of Babylon, not only does he butcher gender identity, but he brainwashes through education. For three years, for three years, they would prepare to stand before the king. For th- and this isn't just, this isn't just the, the people that could get into the school of Babylon. Are you with me? This wasn't, you, gotta, you, <laughs> you went to the job fair and they were there and you got, no, this, they wanted leaders. The spirit of Babylon wanted specific young men to enroll into its program. Like that's the reality here. Uh, men of competence, intelligence, elegance, beauty were required. The best of the best were the only ones that could make the cut to get into the university of Babylon. Are you with me? Where they would be brainwashed. Some of you are like, how could you go to a university like that? Some of you know people in a university like that. Are you with me? You're like, I I have a friend that's enrolled in this school of Babylon. (laughs) Babylon brainwashes through education. While God equips all who follow him, Babylon brainwashes leaders to follow it. Are you with me? 70% of students in the church drop out their first year of college. They're never connected again. 70%. That study has been proven again and again and again. Why is college ministry important? Because of that statistic right there. Because students are enrolled in schools of Babylon and they need to hear the gospel to be liberated from this bondage. Are you with me, church? Amen. Lastly, Babylon Bragent watches through education, and then we see what, what at the very end, and the king assigned them a daily portion of food that the king ate and the wine that he drank, and they were to be educated again for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. All of this is for some sick purpose, to stand before a wicked king. That's all of it, to stand before that dean, to stand before that, that, that president of that university, to stand before that king, like that was the reality. And among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Oh, how convenient. Daniel, he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah, he called Shadrach. Mishael, he called Meshach. Azariah, he called Abednego. Babylon renames and redefines. That's the agenda of the spirit of Babylon. The chief of the eunuchs renamed these men of God from the family of God. He renamed them. Um, and we're going to throw those uh, names up on the screen. Let's start with Daniel. Daniel, literally in Hebrew, means God is my judge. Belteshazzar means Bel protects his life. Bel was the demon god of that region. And so his name is literally a reversal or a counterfeit of the Hebrew name that God gave him. And, and I'm, I'm guilty because I remember the story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego like that, because that's how I learned it. We should probably call them by their Hebrew names. Are you with me? <laughs> Amen. Can we change that Sunday school curriculum? All right, teachers, let's go. Uh, Hananiah, let's, Yahweh is gracious, but his name is changed to Shadrach, which is the command of Aku. Aku is a demon god in that region. I, I, I live at the command of Yahu, uh, Aku. Uh, Mishael, who is what God is? But Meshach literally translates to who is what Aku is. Wow. Azariah, Yahweh is my helper. But Abednego, servant of Nebu, this demon god. Babylon renames and redefines. While God calls you by name, Babylon renames your name. I need you to hear that. Is this still going on today in our culture? 
I gave you guys a list at the very at the beginning of this sermon of introductions. If you believe in this God and you believe in this book and you believe in what it says, then Babylon is trying to rename you right now. That's the reality of what's going on in this text. So I think first, the first thing we need to see before we move on to the last point and the, the next main section of application, first thing we need to see this morning is that we need to see the counterfeit kingdom for what it is. The spirit of Babylon is still at work today. Are you, would you agree with me? In fact, 1 John talks about the reality that the spirit of the Antichrist is at work right now. A spirit worse than the spirit of Babylon. A spirit that defies Jesus. A spirit that brings about the kingdom and the reign of the Antichrist. That time will come. That time will come. And that time is at work right now. That spirit is at work right now. So may we be warned. But what do we do about it, right? I guess we could stop right there and I could leave you with that and you could chew. Or I could answer the question, what do we do about that? What do we do about this? What do we do in this kind of world when we're under this kind of fire? And the answer is beautiful. And the answer is timeless. We do what Daniel did. Well, let's see what he did. Verse 8. Are you ready? All right. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. Let me just read that again. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. Let me read that again. But Daniel resolved, say it with me, that he would not defile himself. Like, praise God for this. This is it. This is the application today. We're going to unpack it in a minute, but I need you to see this. Like, this is it. A 15-year-old boy who's castrated, who's abused, who's enslaved, resolves that he will not defile himself. What did he have? He didn't have a lot. But he made the resolve that I will not defile myself. Praise God for that. Like, may we see a generation raised with that anthem. Like, we will not defile ourselves. This is what Daniel's refrain is. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of eunuchs to allow him to not defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord and the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he... For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who were of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king? It's very important to present these young men as presentable before the king. Healthy and strong and all of these things. And the eunuch was worried his job was on the line. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Ezra, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. So you're like, he's proposing to be a vegetarian? He was all these things, enslaved, all these. That sounds worse. Are you with me? Some of you are thinking it. Some of you are offended because you're a vegetarian. That's all right. So um, he goes on, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in the flesh than all the youths who ate of the king's food. So the steward took away the food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And at the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them. And among all those, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and the enchanters that were in his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Last point this morning, and I, and I just don't want you to miss this. we got a couple minutes left. We are called, as Daniel was called, to fidelity to God alone. How do you live with faith under fire? You live with fidelity to the one true God alone. You live with loyalness, loyalty. You live with faithfulness to the one true God alone. And we see in verses 8 through 16, we see Daniel's faithfulness and then the outcome of his faithfulness. See, Daniel chose to be faithful. He chose not to defile himself. He made that decision. 
He would not drink the king's wine or eat his food, his meat, his steak, his ribeye. Now, I've messed with you because some of you are hungry. Are you with me? And some of you are like, wait a minute. Uh, he chose to be a vegetarian. Uh, like he's, He chose not to defile himself by drinking the king's wine and the king's steak. That just sounds like a good weekend. Like, why is that? Like, what is he doing here? And the reality is that all the king's wine and the king's meats, they would have been offered to these idols that we mentioned already. That have been offered to the idols of the region. Uh, Daniel, to eat and drink with the king would lead to intimacy with the king's court. It would lead to an abandonment of who, of the one true God for him. And so Daniel, who, think about this, he was a slave. He traveled 700 miles. He'd been captured, enslaved, castrated, forced into this system of education. And then his resolve is not to eat wine and to eat, not to drink wine and to eat meat. That's his resolve as this, as this slave who's been abused. What's interesting here, is, and I, I, the application for us is clear, don't, the resolve we have to make is not to defile ourselves. Like, let us be the people that say, we will not be defiled. Like, that is the resolve. Like, that is the application. That is the point of all of this. What's that mean, to defile ourselves? We defile ourselves when we trade what the king of kings gives for what the world offers. I'm going to say that again. We defile ourselves when we trade what the king of, king, what the king of kings gives for what the world offers. That's when we defile ourselves. And I think the church of America right now is struggling because so many Christians have traded what the king gives for what the world offers. Like, that's why we're struggling. I'm not talking about just, uh, like, the big, the big capital C church. I, like, I'm talking about us as Christians that make up the church. So many of us have traded what God gives for what the world offers. And we need to be like Daniel and stand firm and say, we will no longer be defiled. We will not be defiled. We will serve the one true God. Do you know the fear for pastors right now? Like, and I hear it because I'm around them all the time. I work for 63 churches, including this one. So I get to meet with pastors and go visit churches. That's why I'm not here sometime. And the fear of pastors right now is that this pandemic would give, would give the church and churches and people in the church the freedom to, to pass on the local assembly because they like their living rooms better. Like, like, are you with me? Some of you guys are watching this right now, and I love you, and I, and I hear you, and, and there is a pandemic going on right now. And it's important to practice safety and all these things. Like, that's okay, right? But, but let that not be said of us. Like, that's the fear of pastors is that we would lose church participants because they like the living room better. Not that they're more scared about the virus, all right? If that's your motivation for staying home, then you need to check your heart. Call it into question, right? I think this is interesting for us as we break this down. If, we, if I had three, three observations for application for us before we finish, I would say this. Don't defile his commands for the world's compensation. What does it mean to be faithful? It means to not defile his commands for the world's compensation. The world offers you pleasure, money. It offers you a stress-free existence if you do the right things, right? We're called to not defile ourselves. We're called to put obedience to God first. What's that mean? It means you choose. It means you choose to give more than you receive. It means you choose to stay faithful in marriage even when it's hard. It means you choose forgiveness when those who offend you, they, when what they've done seems unforgivable. It means you choose to obey Jesus even when it goes against what you want to do. May we not defile his commands for the world's compensation. I think, again, we need to not defile ourselves, our calling with the world's comfort. Another just observation. The call to do ministry is for us as a church. The call to make disciples is for us as a church. COVID-19 did not thwart that. COVID-19 did not stop that. What's that mean? It means that you're more excited to get back into church than you are the courts or the field. It means that you care more about sharing Christ and the things of Christ than you do personal opinions and politics. <laughs> Are you with me? What's that mean? It means that you raise children who fear God more than they fear what college they get into. 
Are you with me? Like, we are called not to defile His calling with the world's comfort. We're called not to defile His kingdom with the world's causes. I just want to make this clear. If you want to be a part of a, the solution to racism, the solution to end hatred, if you want to be part of the move that liberates the oppressed and the enslaved, if you want to be a part of a movement that sees hearts mended, families restored, sick healed, the dead raised, look no further. Like, that's the reality. Look no further. Jesus gives us that opportunity. Jesus makes that reality clear. Jesus brought that life here, and he allows us to live in it right now. May we not be defiled. And then, lastly, God rewards our faithfulness. Like, you're like, well, faithfulness is hard, Austin. Fidelity to God, it's hard. Like, you don't understand what I'm going through right now. And, and, and I don't, but God does. But he still calls you to be faithful. He calls you to hold on. He calls you to remain steadfast. And in the end, he rewards your faithfulness. He rewards it. He doesn't have to, but he does. For Daniel, we see he blesses him with influence. He blesses him with wisdom. And at the end, he blesses his legacy. He blesses him with influence and favor. Daniel had influence. He had favor with the chief of the eunuchs. He had favor with those he was working with. He had favor. That's just so, it's just so funny to me. We want to get ahead in this world. And the lie is that by working more hours, by knowing the right people, by selling your soul, you'll be more successful. And the, the reality for the Christians is trust God and be faithful to him. Like, that's it. Like, that's success. Yeah, you might not have a massive retirement account, but you'll spend eternity with the king. <laughs> and it's worth it. God blesses him with influence. He blesses him with wisdom. As young teenagers, Daniel and his friends, think about this, they were smarter and wiser than all other people in the kingdom. That's what we see. They baffled the magicians and the enchanters and the witches, all the people with all their education. They could not master, they could not figure out why Daniel and his friends were so smart and so wise. Why were they wise? Because they were faithful. Because they were faithful to God alone. And he gave them wisdom. And God ultimately blesses his legacy. If you look at the very last verse of 21, it says this, And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. And you'd say to me, Austin, that doesn't sound like God blessed his legacy. Like we know that he didn't have a family because he was most likely a eunuch. He would spend 70 plus years of his life in this foreign region, in the king's court. He would never go home. And I just want to speak to you for a second. Not, Daniel didn't get to live his best life now. Daniel's life of faithfulness was not the American dream. Daniel would live as a slave for the entirety of his life, and he would die in this foreign land. But God did bless his legacy. We're going to turn to chapter 2, and we're going to read two verses, and then we're done. Are you guys still okay this morning? All right. This is where God's Word comes alive, and I I can't wait to show you what we're about to see. Daniel chapter 2, just look at, we're just going to read a verse here, and then one other passage, as God blesses his legacy. Going to the end of this dream in chapter 2, Daniel interprets this dream, and in verse 47, at the end of all this, this amazing turn of events, the king answered and said, Daniel... Truly, your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him the ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief what? Prefect. And the chief what? Turn to your neighbor and say prefect. Prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel made a request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained in the king's court. You're like, Austin, it's not getting better. You said he blessed legacy, but he's still in the king's court. Chapter 2 didn't change that. Chapter 3 doesn't change that. Chapter 10 doesn't change that. Like, what is the reality here? Well, the reality here is that, that God put Daniel to work in the king's court. In fact, he made him a prefect in the king's court. You're like, I'm still not following you. That's okay. Daniel would be the one that would influence the teaching, the demonic doctrines, all the stuff that was being taught in the school and the University of Babylon. Now Daniel is a professor. He's an adjunct professor in the school and the University of Babylon. 
He's over the wise men. He's over the people. He's over the system in the school of Babylon. He's the chief prefect. He's the dean of the department for his entirety of his career here in Babylon. You guys still with me? 600 years later. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the what? From the what? Who traveled to the west from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Going into verse 7, if you're following, I'm just going to jump a little ahead. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and asserted from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After seeing, after listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them and uh, and it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, when they saw the child with Mary, his mother, they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts. What were the gifts? Gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So you guys are, are, are following and you're seeing something for the first time. This changes how I see the nativity scene. Are you with me? But let me just break this down if you're not there and if you're watching from home. Because Daniel was faithful, 600 years later, wise men from the east, most likely the land of Babylon, the former land of Babylon, they traveled, some would say, about 700 miles. That's why they didn't just show up the first night with the shepherds. They showed up later because they had a long way to go. They traveled 700 miles to announce the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You're like, well, how did they know that? They could have only known about his coming. If somebody had been a part of their teaching and a part of their culture and had told them about the king that would come one day, they could have only known if someone Maybe a 15-year-old, enslaved, castrated peasant would have been in their homeland teaching a curriculum on the coming of the, the king. Because Daniel was faithful, these wise men come to announce the king of kings. And not only that, because Daniel was faithful, these wise men, they bring worship back to God. What was the first gift that they bring? Gold. This side of the room. What was the first, the first gift they bring? Gold. What was the first thing the spirit of Babylon stole from the temple of God? This side of the room. Gold. Oh my goodness. Could it be that the wise men brought the same gold <laughs> that was stolen 600 years earlier from the temple of the one true God and they laid it at the feet of a baby of a young boy, of a young Jesus. The same gold that was used to worship the one true God is laid at the feet of the child who is God. Are you with me? And what's the second gift? Frankincense. Third gift? Myrrh. It's, isn't it interesting that those are the two gifts as we look at Exodus chapter 30. Those two gifts are the thing, those two things are the key essential ingredient to worshiping God in the temple. In his temple, these things were used in every part of worship. They were the thing that, that filled the temple. It was the Roma. And these things are laid at the feet of young Jesus. Myrrh is an interesting component too because myrrh isn't just something that was used in the temple to worship God. It was also, an, it was also something that was used to embalm the dead. It's almost like the wise men, them laying these gifts down at Jesus. They were prophesying that this is God, that this is the king who would die and who would become king forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. It's almost like they were doing that. Hmm. 
<laughs> Let me just close with this. Because, because Daniel was faithful, these wise, these wise men, they foreshadow the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Because he was faithful, because he was faithful, God leaves a legacy behind that is fruitful because he was faithful. God uses our fidelity in him alone to champion a future about him alone. Like that's what God does. When we are faithful, God makes us fruitful even if we don't see it in our lifetime. If we keep holding on, if we keep walking in obedience, if we keep sacrificing of ourselves, if we keep holding the faith, if we just keep believing, God will use it for his glory. That is the story of Daniel chapter 1. And all God's people said, amen. amen. How do we live in a world where our faith is increasingly under fire? We do that by living like Daniel. We do that by, by living with fidelity to God alone, by choosing not to defile ourselves with the things of this world. Are you doing that this morning, church? Let's pray to that end. Father, thank you so much for this time. And God, as we close and, and begin a time of invitation, God, I pray if there's anyone in the room, if there's anyone listening to this service, if there's anyone that's listening to this after the fact that does not know you, God, I pray that they would see that you are the great God, that you are the one true God, that you are faithful, that you are loyal, that you are a God worth following with everything we have. God, I pray that we would see that. I pray that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. God, if there's someone listening to this message that does not know you, God, I pray that they would repent. I pray that they would turn uh, from, from a heart that would seek things that are less than. God, and I pray that they would seek you, God, with their whole life. Bless us as we worship you and as we respond to the truth of your word. It's in the name of Jesus I pray, amen.